Well, this is going to be a little bit of a change of pace with, with my talk, because I'll be talking about uh, geologic history, not so much imaging, not so much uh, monitoring, but uh, the information we can get out of the geologic record. Um, and the, I guess the purpose of this talk too, and I, I thank the uh, organizers for inviting me, is to give some perspective on how the lower crust uh, acts and what are the relationships between the lower crust dynamics and the rest of, of the system, uh, the upper crust and the surface in particular. So um, two points that, that I think I'll try to illustrate. One is that the uh, flow of the deep crust really stabilizes orogenic crust. So um, in fact, we kind of know that because if we look at the North American continent and we look at the deep levels of um, uh, lithologies, we find that in fact a lot of these deep levels are made of migmatites, are made of rocks that were partially molten once and have crystallized at those depths. Um, the, the second point I would like to make is that the fl uh, flow of, of, of uh, the deep crust is dynamically linked to the upper crust and the surface. Because there has been a lot of interest in um, <clears throat> flowing crust, particularly trying to understand the Tibetan plateau. And uh, many people have looked at this problem, and I think it has been a very exciting couple of decades for that reason, for, for us working on high-grade rocks, to try to understand how our work actually participates in understanding geodynamics, in particular large-scale geodynamics of origins. Now, this crust that flows at depth often leaks, leaks out, and, and it leaks out in migmatite domes. And here I show simply, um, in fact, this is in the, now the western part of Himalaya, in the uh, Pamirs region, where there are some of the largest domes that are filled with uh, partially molten crust and that have come up underneath detachments, underneath extensional detachments, but they are probably driven by thrusts underneath or some kind of channel flow to allow them to come close to the surface. Um, of course, I, I'll be concentrating here on uh, North America because th this is where we have done a lot of our work and, uh, and I think it is quite relevant to some of the issues that we are dealing uh, with ESCOP and, uh, and associated projects. So we came uh, to this problem from a geologic perspective. So we, we started working in the northern part of the um, North American Cordillera in the Thorodin Dome, which is part of the Schuswab Metamorphic Ore Complex in BC. But then we, we quickly found that a lot of these systems had something in common, and it is that, particularly for the, for the northern Metamorphic Ore Complex um, in this region here, it is that uh, a lot of these Metamorphic Ore Complex are cored by migmatite domes. Ooh. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, these migmatite domes uh, often had been mapped as basement, uh, old Precambrian basement, and some of them certainly are, but they, they have been very dynamic in, the, in participating in building the North American Cordillera. In fact, an argument can be made that that they are some of the latest features that, that have participated in um, making and collapsing that orogen. In particular, um, in, in the Thorodin Dome, which is uh, part of the, uh, of in, in, just in BC here, um, the migmatite core is made of, of these migmatites, which are really bands of granite and, and, uh, and solid rock at the time, uh, I guess. I, I shouldn't use a, the pointer. Um, so uh, we, we, when you date the zircons in those, in those layers, particularly the, the granitic layers, you find that indeed you have a Precambrian history there recorded, but you also have um, uh, Eocene, Paleocene or Eocene uh, growth on the zircons or even new zircons that are of that age, telling you that there is a lot of melt that crystallized uh, at, that, at that time. And in fact, when we look at uh, the metamorphic um, assemblages in those rocks, what we find is a lot of evidence of decompression. And, and this has been found, I, I think, in all of the migmatite domes, where, for example, kyanite is replaced by uh, symplectites of uh, sapphirine, spinel, and so on, which indicate a disequilibrium texture. So this rock was at depth uh, at some high temperature and then was decompressed very rapidly, leading to these disequilibrium textures. Um, overall, we have a path that follows uh, kyanite to silimonite, 
um, as you can see on this PT diagram here, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the solid line, the, the black line, corresponds to the path that was derived uh, using metamorphic petrology, uh, and the other colored lines are lines that have been derived from models that, that we have run, so that we will see later. And overall, uh, these domes, um, uh, the rocks inside the domes, made it very close to, to the surface. In fact, uh, we have uh, done recent work now with our student uh, uh, Erkan Toraman, who uh, in the Thorodin Dome has found that the um, uh, cooling of the rocks that are now part of the dome um, is um, uh, happen actually very quickly at about just following the crystallization of these rocks and the progressive exhumation and cooling of these rocks that was um, that, 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 that was um, uh, marked and defined by um, isotopic systems such as potassium argon, argon argon in various minerals. But what he found is that uh, even very low temperature thermochronometers registered time um, shortly after emplacement of these domes, particularly for the rocks that are, that are making the peaks of these mountains in British Columbia. Now, for those rocks that are deep in the valley, they have recorded now young incision, and you can see that on the bottom uh, temperature time uh, diagram, where there is a little bit of, of uh, cooling uh, very recently. In fact, he, he, I think he has demonstrated that this cooling is associated with the recent glaciation-related incision of this terrain. So these rocks come up very fast, and so therefore they have to come from somewhere. And um, um, in general, what we can say is that there is a great degree of localization of deformation in the upper crust that leads to uh, exhumation of the flowing crust. And this is achieved by a structure that is called a rolling hinge detachment. And Brian Wernicke here is very familiar with, with this definition. In the meantime, since his work, um, a lot of work has been done on oceanic core complexes also where it is absolutely demonstrated that a rolling hinge mechanism has to be active uh, in that system, in that much simpler system, so easier to, to, to demonstrate. Um, so what our experience, I think, has been um, in looking at the flow of orogenic crust, um, hot crust at depth, and the structures near the surface is that if the crust is not very hot, that is, if the moho is not very hot, then we have a fairly good coupling between the mid-crust and the upper crust and the development of lots of faults uh, in a basin and range type of system. When the um, system, when, when, when this orogenic crust contains a layer that is very hot and very low viscosity, then um, localization in the upper crust tends to occur. And this has been also uh, worked on and demonstrated, I think, quite well uh, for oceanic core complexes, again, where the system is much simpler by people like Roger Buck and, and, um, and Lavier, for instance. But if, if the, um, uh, which would be this case here, if the, the crust is now very hot, moho is very hot, we have a layer that is partially molten at the bottom of the crust, and we are going to see that as soon as extension takes place in the upper crust, this lower crust rushes up upward uh, towards the surface. And as a result, that leads to the metamorphic path that we see in those domes and um, with, with a suite of uh, uh, structural development that we will see in, in the models that we have run. So in order to, to understand this um, kind of system, we decided to do some, some modeling, but some very simple modeling with very simple boundary conditions. So this is not fully integrated to what is going on um, in, in, on the plate tectonic scale. It is simply to look at, at the behavior of the lower crust in those systems. And we have used a model that is now kind of antiquated, actually, ellipsis, which was part of the battery of models that have led to Gale and, and, other, and other models. Um, but that, that's how, where the melt fraction or the melt function that we are using was developed using ellipsis. So we, we kept uh, using this kind of model. And so what we have done is, is to not only uh, um, decide that um, viscosity was going to decrease as a function of depth, but also that there would be a threshold of decrease in viscosity wherever we felt, we, we felt or thermodynamics tells us that the solidus should be in the crust. 
And so underneath that solidus in the crust, then the rock should be partially molten. And if they are partially molten, then their viscosity can be related to the melt fraction. And that, that's what we did with these models. That was a, a, a little innovative at the time, I, I would think. We apply these models uh, on the stability of this kind of system where we have a plateau for land um, contact, if you will, relationship. And, and we have learned quite a bit from these models. Uh, these are uh, some, some results. Uh, kind of at random because I'm actually not going to focus on those, but we clearly see that when we have um, uh, when we have um, this kind of setup with a thick uh, crust, uh, even though it is all thermally equilibrated, um, and even under fixed boundary conditions, so we are not co contracting here, we are not extending, we are just letting the system uh, evolve, and we see that there is, of course, a flow from the plateau towards the foreland that can take different shape de depending on many things, depending on the role of buoyancy, depending on the strength of the foreland, etc., etc. But I'm not going to, to detail those models, but I, I want to show you some basic, very simple features associated with the extension of um, the extension of thickened crust, hot crust. So that would be, in essence, what is going on in this system here. So we are kind of zooming in on this system. And that's to make, of course, the models very simple. We have a, a uniform thickness crust, but it is thick, about 60 kilometers. You see that somewhere here is the solidus that separates the partially molten crust at the bottom and the ductile crust in yellow above. And we have uh, the upper crust above that is kind of grayish, and blue is the sky, okay? And of course, the moho is at the base of that, of that reddish layer. So uh, this is all kind of uh, uh, temperature uh, dependent, uh, and as a result, depth dependent uh, viscosity. And um, when these models are run, uh, we put um, strain markers to, to be able to, to, to track actually uh, how the, the model is behaving. And I'm going to start the models now. Um, and uh, you see the top one, which I think I can stop and restart, yes. The top one is actually uh, one where we decided to pull at the boundaries, but relatively slowly. So this would take 20 million years uh, for to, to occur. Uh, in this case, and in fact, we are going to see it in the other case uh, much more uh, readily. In this case, what we have is that as soon as fracture happens here and extension of the upper crust occurs, there is a call of the low viscosity crust uh, towards this low pressure zone, which mechanically makes a lot of sense. But that's, that, this is a very significant flow, so differential motion of the lower crust relative to the rest of the crust. So let's run this one here. What is happening now is that all of these rocks are rushing underneath this zone of extension, making this structure that looks a bit like a diapir, but it is not one because buoyancy may be turned off and, and, and uh, we still have this uh, phenomenon occurring. And um, then if, if we do it relatively slowly like here, the solidus goes up, but then the rocks go through the solidus towards the surface. If, uh, on the contrary, we, we, we take um, 10 times faster uh, pool at, at, the, at the boundaries, then what we have is a situation where you see the lower crust coming very close to the surface, which, um, uh, of course, uh, our, geologic, um, our geologic evidence is probably somewhere between these two extremes in terms of rates of extension, but certainly the fact that we have um, these types of structures that develop and also the PT past that we observe and also the thermochronology of these rocks from crystallization to, to complete cooling of these rocks that is happening very fast. All of this is consistent with this kind of, with this kind of model. So this, is, um, the, the, this was to illustrate what we can say about flowing crust. And it is important, I think, to realize that crust is not uh, static on a vertical uh, in the vertical dimension, but there can be a lot of lateral motion of that crust that can be solicited by whatever is happening at the surface. Uh, Beaumont's group has demonstrated that erosion can, can lead possibly to crustal flow, and so there, there is the other type of forces that can participate in the system. But this crust is very mobile. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the links to, uh, to, to the surface. And the link to the surface in terms of this partially molten crust is actually uh, a hydrologic uh, link, uh, we think. And um, uh, the, the, the reason is that when this crust moves and is being exhumed by whatever structure, 
is exhuming it, typically a rolling hinge detachment system. Then above that detachment, we have a very broken up crust that is very permeable, in which there are lots of fault vertical structures, and this crust can, can, uh, can, can uh, because it is very permeable, it can transmit fluids, fluids from the surface to depth, and then the other condition that is realized in this particular system is kind of a hydrothermal system, if you will, it is that the heat that is provided by pulling in hot material close to the surface is actually driving convection of the fluids in the upper crust. And we have very good evidence for that. Um, that is in the stable isotope record of, the, of, the, of, of some of the rocks that are in that system. The principle is very simple. Um, so there are two things about the stable isotope record. One is to demonstrate that we have meteoric water. If this water came from the surface, it should carry a, um, an oxygen isotope uh, or a hydrogen isotope um, um, surface meteoric uh, signature. And, um, and then, depending on where that catchment area is, particularly its elevation, there would be also some um, relationship between the elevation and the values that we get if we can tap that water uh, in, uh, d deeper in the crust. So th this is what we, we have attempted here. Uh, you see the basic relationship of basically decreasing delta O18, getting more and more negative, delta D getting, it, getting more and more negative as a function of elevation. So high elevation catchment should have very, very negative uh, delta O18 or delta D values. In fact, there is, uh, th this has been calibrated, um, uh, relatively calibrated from empirical relations as well as theoretical uh, considerations. And there is a good relationship between altitude and, um, and the delta D in this case of meteoric water, which suggests that we can use, we may be able to use this relationship uh, in paleoaltimetry. So trying to figure out how high these, uh, the surface was at the time, whatever time, uh, is recorded in, in, in the little capsule of geologic material that we have. Um, and that's really important because there are not many ways to know how high the surface was in the past. So uh, developing these methods is really important. Our contribution to it uh, has been to look at uh, these detachment systems as hydrothermal systems. And what we have found is that mica, for example, here you see those mac muscovite fish, they are called. Um, which are, in this case, possibly the only hydrous phase, so it's, it's able to incorporate water in its crystal lattice. And these micas, when we analyzed their geochemistry, we found that, in fact, they contain, they interacted with water that was extremely negative uh, in delta D. Um, so this became the base uh, for, 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 you know, kind of larger scale work um, all over the, um, the detachments that are exposed in the North American Cordillera, where we have systematically looked at all of these detachments. That was the first one here in the Shuswap Metamorphic Complex in Thorodin again. Um, and these are the data I kind of uh, tilted the diagram here to show uh, basically height uh, or, you know, vertical distance here. Um, and the values, the point is that the values that we measure in the uh, minerals, whether it is in the Kettle Dome here or in the Shuswap, uh, are very negative, see, on the order of minus uh, 150 delta D, which is, which is very negative. So we, um, we did that, sorry, <clears throat> over many different uh, detachment systems and using paleoaltimetry, so you see the values there for uh, the Columbia River detachment that comes down into the US, actually. Um, for um, the Keton detachment, so that, that would be the latitude of the Priest River, pretty much uh, the uh, U.S.-Canadian border. Uh, as we come down into the Bitterroot, um, we uh, have another cross-section, and then we come to the southern detachments where we've done some work and some are not displayed here. For example, the Raft River detachment or the Snake River detachment in Nevada. So um, uh, what, what we have here are very negative values, as you can, as you can see on the order of minus 140 or minus 150 per mil delta D, which indicates that all of these minerals interacted with meteoric water and that the surface was very high at that time. So, um, actually I'm going to skip that. At the same time, at the same time that um, this work was, was being done, and of course, 
you know, you, you might say, well, what is the use of having a single value from a shear zone, you know, some uh, somewhere at depth? What does it tell you? Well, what, what it tells us is that it is actually a, a time average value over which the meteoric water had to be, had to carry that very negative signal, because otherwise it, it would not have been preserved um, during the time um, of crystallization of the mica, which is not instantaneous, which has some, some geologic uh, timescale to it. So it's been very interesting to, to do both um, uh, analyses, to look at, to take our approach, and then to work collaboratively with Paige Chamberlain's group, who has looked at uh, the stable isotope record in the basins at the surface. Now the basins, because they record a very different timescale, have a tendency to show great variations. Our signal at depth is certainly smoothed out um, compared to all of these details. But the, the link is very interesting. In fact, this is the work by, uh, uh, that is published by Mix et al. recently. It shows here on the left a map of the uh, current uh, values of, um, of delta O18 for precipitation uh, in the western US and uh, the sample localities next to it. So you look at the sample localities done a la Chamberlain, I would say, and it is getting close to uh, you know, a NERSCOPE type uh, resolution, if you will. And so that's one example in which a geologic approach, a geologic method, can be applied very systematically over a very large area, sampling various sections of basins. So the results are that when, when uh, we look at uh, both, actually, our, you know, our approach and, and the sedimentary basin approach, what we find is that um, the western U.S., remained, you know, relatively low elevation, likely pre-49 million years, okay? So these are the blue dots. The redder it gets, the higher elevation, it, 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 or the, the lower value, the value of delta D or delta O18, and therefore the higher elevation. But you will see that uh, in the time slice 49 to 39 million years, we start to have a shift in this region here, and by the time we are in this, in this uh, region of time, uh, the values are actually not that different from what they are today for all over the um, western U.S. Now, uh, 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 taking a look at this data in more, in more detail, again, this is work by Mix et al., what we can see is that th there has been pretty much a wave of topography building that started in the north at about uh, 50 million years or so and, and then propagated southward. So th this is the kind, I think, of... Uh, of, uh, of result that can be compared to a, a much larger scale uh, geodynamic, um, um, geodynamic interpretation of what has happened um, in uh, Western North America during Cenozoic time. So in conclusion, then, uh, the orogenic lower crust flows laterally and vertically and stabilizes orogenic crust. Um, and uh, again, uh, we, we, we had a talk um, uh, yesterday, I think, uh, looking at uh, xenoliths uh, from the deep crust where uh, one interpretation is that, uh, this, this, uh, that this crust really remained at depth and cooled over a very long time, uh, signifying that this crust got very stable. But before that, it was a very dynamic crust under the Corrado Plateau. Um, extension of upper crust is dynamically linked to uh, lowest viscosity crustal layer. Um, this is a very important point. I think that the upper crust and lower crust are very, are very tied together. Um, and, um, and it is one that we need to explore more as we look at uh, the, the, the dynamics of the system uh, more generally. Now, the extensional shear zones that exhume the lower crust participate in this uh, hydrothermal system. And then paleoaltimetry, I think, has become a, a tool that we have to look at uh, variations in time and in space of topography in relation to crustal flow, because uh, this wave, actually, of topography corresponds to a wave of structural um, activity in which the metamorphic core complexes, uh, which are older in the north, become progressive, progressively uh, younger towards the south, and, and the, 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 alt, the elevation of the earth um, follows that same pattern. Of course, in that same pattern, we also have a progression of volcanism from um, north to south, which gives us very good possibilities of linking uh, mantle processes 
with crustal processes. And then just a final uh, thought here, uh, what is the Earthscopy uh, next big thing? Well, so certainly whatever, whatever it is, it, it would have to use Earthscope as a model uh, for geoscience, I think, because, because of the culture change that, that has happened over the last decade, particularly in terms of open results, community input, etc., that has become almost uh, modus operandi for uh, all of the large projects that we are conducting. Um, we would need, of course, uh, people like me working on crustal problems. We would need, need higher resolution images, uh, particularly of active tectonic regions, because there we, we have an opportunity to, to see uh, the rocks in action and, and to understand the processes that then we can apply to our geologic understanding more generally. Uh, and um, possibly also a healthy balance of observations and, and, and modeling. Uh, even if it doesn't take all of the, you know, the terabytes and <laughs> that, that we, that we uh, heard about uh, the, this morning. Uh, and we'll have a breakout session to talk about these things, about continental, uh, the continental realm, in room 305A. Thank you.